listening to To Hatch a Pod with Key Budge, Corey Costello, Greg Garrett, and Ashley Whitmore. It's To Hatch a Pod time. Key Budge joining you today. I have a special guest from Kern County Public Health, Kim Hernandez, lead epidemiologist. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. All right. Well, welcome to To Hatch a Pod. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, uh, I, you and I, we got to chat for just a minute or two before we started recording, and I kind of briefed you on, uh, we were uh, Greg Garrett, myself, Maya Costa, we were in a conference in Fresno County, oh, maybe four, five, six weeks ago. And it was a communication-based conference, but there was a lot of uh, public health officials from different counties. And they gave us one of those uh, real world assignments, okay? And pick a topic and we want you to make a presentation on it. And everyone that was in our group was from Tulare County Public Health, Fresno County Public Health. And we were the only ones that were really kind of the uh, communication people, but, but only the only ones from Kern County. They all wanted to talk about measles. And Greg and I looked at each other and said, really? And we started in the conversation realizing that measles has made a comeback. Yes, it has. So let me ask you about that. And, and so with just in this part- in, in particular with, with measles and the, the comeback that we're seeing, what, what's it like here in Kern County? I know there's, it's kind of, there's different parts of the state of California where they're seeing a little bit higher occurrence. Mm-hmm. But what, how, we, how are we looking here in Kern County? So here in Kern County, we haven't had a, a case of measles, um, you know, transmitted in Kern County for many, many years. If you go way right. back when, we had a huge outbreak involving more than a thousand people back in 1991. So that was a long time ago. We do occasionally have exposures that happen in Kern County. Um, all of the recent ones have not been in Kern County residents, but rather people who have traveled through Kern County and stopped for a reason. They took a break, they spent the night, and then they traveled onward and then after the fact we find out there's been exposure and that many people in our community might have been exposed to measles. Luckily all of those recent exposure events have not resulted in any cases mostly because many people are vaccinated against measles and that the the measles vaccine is a very very effective one and produces immunity in the vast majority of people who've been fully vaccinated. What we see right now in sort of the resurgence of measles throughout the United States um, it tends to pop up in largely unvaccinated vaccinated populations. And so groups of people who have chosen not to get vaccinated um, run the risk of when you get introduced into a susceptible population, measles is highly, highly infectious. 90% of people who um, have a measles infection are going to pass it on to another person. And this is actually one of the most infectious airborne um, viral infections that we we deal with today in that if you have a room full of people who are susceptible to measles, almost every single person in that room is going to get it. And measles as an airborne virus is also one that um, it's very, very small and it kind of hangs out in the air. And so uh, an air space can be um, contaminated with measles virus and cause an infection in another person two hours after the infected person has left. And so it's not just you and me being in the same room talking, but if I leave here and I'm gone for an hour and somebody else comes in to do the next podcast with you, they can still get an infection. And so measles is so highly infectious and this is why we worry about it because it's easy to expose lots and lots of people with just one person. And what we're seeing sort of in the... um, in the U.S. today is that, you know, even though we've declared the U.S. sort of measles free, we've had measles elimination since 2000, where we haven't had ongoing transmission of measles in the U.S. since then, what we do is we have sort of imported cases. People travel to other countries where measles is still circulating very regularly. And then if they get sick and then they come home, then they can transmit it to others. And so we see the same thing kind of happen throughout the states where, like I said, they may not live here, but if they travel through here and they stop at a gas station, stop at a restaurant, stop to do some shopping, you know, then they have potentially exposed other people. And that our job at the public health department is to try to identify all of those people. So it's kind of a um, not unexpected that this is something in a communications training and a communications group, they'd really want to talk about it because a lot of communication has to happen, right? In a very public event, I don't know the name of every single person we're going to try to call and say, hey, you might have been exposed to measles, watch out for symptoms. And so it ends up being um, typically a very large public announcement, you know, through the news, through all of our media um forums of saying, hey, if you were at this location between this time and this time, you might have been exposed to measles. 
if you've had you know two doses of your measles vaccine, MMR or MMRV, you're very likely immune and don't have anything to worry about. But if you are someone like an infant and too young to be vaccinated, um, or if for some reason you haven't completed your vaccine series, you, there is you know a high likelihood that you could come down sick. And so measles typically presents, you know, with a high fever and then you break out in this rash. And so people generally know they have symptoms, but unfortunately you can be infectious with measles before those symptoms really start. So before that rash breaks out four days before you might be transmitting it to other people. So this is part of the reason why it is so infectious and so easy to pass around because I might be starting to feel run down, but I don't really know I'm sick and I don't really know yet that I shouldn't be around other people. And so this is probably why this is why it got right. brought up because there's just so much communication that needs to happen with the public to find every individual person trying to reach those highest risk people, um, particularly, you know, our very young children, um, people who are older with sort of lowered immune systems um, that we want to be careful because while, you know, most people before 1963, like almost everybody got measles. Um, but what we found is, you know, one in a thousand to maybe three in a thousand people will die of measles if they catch it. And, you know, one in five, about 20% end up in the hospital. And so this is something that can be um, really, really debilitating. Um, and so this is why, you know, this is one of the vaccine preventable diseases we have now because there was so much effort put into protecting us from measles. And so this is another reason why it's really important to stay up to date on your immunizations. You know, if you have young children, make sure they've been immunized um, against measles in particular because it is so infectious. You know, it can um, result in lots of complications. And it's just, you know, something that can be really devastating and used to be very devastating, you know, in the U.S. and around the world. Well, let's let's go back to the vaccine, because that, that seems to be one of those words that now, since COVID, everyone, there's, it becomes a, a, a polarization around that word. But there is history with the measles vaccine. There is a track record. We do have science behind it to know the effectiveness of this vaccine we basically had eradicated it here in the united states and then so what's the age group that would normally get this the, the measles vaccine what's so typically you get the measles vaccine when you turn one. That's the, the normal age when, when you bring children in for their one year appointment. That's usually when you start the measles vaccine series. And like I mentioned, there's two different vaccines out there. There's the MMR, which has measles, mumps, and rubella. And then there's also MMRV, which is measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella, which is chicken pox. So, you know, one of those two vaccines you typically start um, when you are a year old. And then most um, kids will get a second dose by the, around four to six, so before you go into kindergarten. You know, the one dose of measles vaccine is very, very effective. 95% of people with that one dose will be immune and they won't get sick, they won't come down with complications. When you get that second dose in before you go to kindergarten, it's 99% of people will be immune. And so this is a very, very effective vaccine. Um, measles containing vaccine has been around for more than 60 years, you know, so it has a very long track record. Um, what we use now, um, you know, with the combination vaccines, um, I think the MMR came out first in 1971. You know, so again, you know, they've been around for a long time. And really what we saw, the, you know, the effectiveness of it was before the vaccine was available, 500,000 people a year were getting measles. 500 people a year were dying from measles in the United States. And after the measles um, vaccine was made available, we, you know, during this time of you know, measles elimination, we've had as low as 34 cases across the entire United States. Wow. And so it's done a very good job at protecting, particularly our small children, because they're the most vulnerable, the most likely to be hospitalized, to get encephalitis and have brain damage, you know, and to potentially die from this infectious disease. So with this resurgence that, that we're seeing now, are, are we seeing it among children? Is that with this, the, and here in California, we've seen it more in Northern California and it's kind of worked its way to part of Central California or am I mistaken with that? It kind of, it, it pops up in different places, you know, okay. where we usually see sort of that first case of measles as it enters into a community is in sort of these larger um, metropot metropolitan areas, right? Okay. Um, if you think about, you know, large events where people come from other areas to visit. And so that's generally where we see it, you know, every now and then it's a, a family member who came to visit, but it usually is people coming into large group settings because that's where you have the opportunity to expose lots of people. Um, and so we tend to 
to see it, you know, kind of in the Bay Area or Los Angeles, San Diego kind of counties. And so we're generally in Kern County, not the place where we first see it happen. You know, we can see sort of the after effects if an outbreak is going on. Um, you know, currently there's an outbreak going on in Illinois, the state of Illinois, and they're really just kind of working on it and trying to wrap, you know, wrap the services around the notification on people that says you might have been exposed. You need to watch out for symptoms. Um, you should stay home if you develop any of these. You really want to avoid being in large groups of people just in case you get sick because we just never know. No one wants to be the person that exposes that itty bitty baby who's too young to be vaccinated mm -hmm. and who's especially vulnerable, you know, because when little itty bitty babies get sick, they need a lot of help, a lot of support, and they often end up in the hospital. Are we seeing uh, less children get that vaccination now? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, you know, when we look at um, our school-based data, when we look at kindergartners and with their vaccination rates, um, we're hovering around 92% of our kindergartners have gotten both doses of their MMR. And if you think back just a few years, you know, in 2000. 15, 2016, we were at 97%. So the vast majority of our kids were being immunized and, and protected by the time they went to school. And so we do know um, after, you know, the effects of what have gone on for the last few years that vaccination rates have dipped. Um, and we're really kind of concerned about that because um, for measles in particular, you know, we consider sort of a 95% vaccination rate enough to kind of protect the rest of the community. When you hear people talk about herd immunity, there's right. been a lot of talk about that. Because measles is so infectious, we need as many people as possible immune to it so it doesn't continue to transmit in a community. And so for many, many years um, in Kern County, we had really good vaccination rates. We tended to be at or above the state average. Um, and in the last few years, we've kind of dip down to, you know, 91, 92%, which makes us nervous. Because if we think about the last time, you know, um, in California, where we had a lot of concern about an ongoing outbreak was about 2014, 15. Um, if you remember, there was one that really centered around um, transmission happening from Disneyland, where a person brought it into, you know, a large theme park like that, transmitted to a number of people. And we watched very carefully during that time with our proximity to LA of, you know, are we going to have any residual cases from that? And we didn't but we also had a very a largely vaccinated population and so as time has gone on um, and we have had um, less vaccination in some of our children or at least um, delayed right not on schedule as we would have uh, routinely um, uh, expected that some of these kids are behind you know many of them have one dose but they need to get their second one you know into kindergarten because for a lot of these kids this is the first time they're going to be around a lot of people and then of course expose you know and have that potential exposure in these group settings and so this is something we're really working with a lot of our schools with our healthcare community about making sure our kids get and stay up to date on their immunizations it's i guess it's one of the ripple effects from COVID 19. Yes. So it kind of as I just get, kind of mentioned, don't want to get on the political end of these, but it's the polarization of, of something. And here is something that was proven. It was proven to work. And then it kind of got thrown into a category of, no, I'm, I'm done. Or, or, or it's just another vax. It's another government ploy. But the facts were there. The, the science behind it, um, it worked. And I guess that's kind of the bottom line. Like you said, there's a big difference between 97% and 91, 92%. I mean, it doesn't seem like much, but it really is a significant number that if that amount of your population is exposed, you know, or, or is susceptible, um, and Kern County, as we, as we had talked, and maybe it was before we started recording, but we talked about this being one of those uh, Kern County is an area where people come through yes. on their next destination, whether it's going from San Francisco to Vegas, LA to Sacramento, whatever, they're going to stop here. They're going to get their gas. They're going to refuel. And we are the ones that end up with the uh, kind of the impact, if you will. Right. You know, and then that's a really good point where we just, you know, we know over the last couple of years, it was difficult for a lot of parents to get their kids into the doctor's office and to have right. their regular well child visits and making sure those vaccines were given as well as all of the other things you check at those well child visits. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, um, transition happened with healthcare providers where pediatricians may have close practices, retired, things like that. And so establishing care again is really important. When we think about, you know, sort of our older adults, you know, they were likely vaccinated as children and they were likely vaccinated as children because their parents saw the effects of people who didn't have a um, measles vaccine. You know, many people um, who are now sort of grandparents, they either had measles themselves, they knew somebody with measles, they knew somebody who got really 
sick, you know, somebody who might have had seizures as a result, you know, deafness as a result. And so they really, you know, the, the risks and the benefits for them were very different than we see now where you and I may not know anybody who's ever had measles or know right. anybody, you know, even if we knew someone, they may not have had those severe complications. But back when everybody got it, everybody knew somebody who was adversely affected. And so we kind of get through this sort of generational thing that says, well, it's not really a big deal, right? It's it's eliminated in the United States. We don't worry about measles anymore, but we forget if we stop protecting, we can easily slip back into a place where we get back to 500,000 cases and 500 deaths a year. And so this is something that's really important to provide that protection early early on, especially when they're young, because especially with the measles vaccine, it lasts a lifetime. And, you know, that we can protect the next generation by getting them vaccinated. Because, you know, like any any population, there's going to be that handful of people for one reason or another who can't be immunized. And so it really falls on the rest of us to be immune so that we don't get sick and pass right. it to those people who can't, you know, use this tool to protect themselves. And it's our responsibility as a community to protect our most vulnerables. None of, the, you know, the babies being born today are protected against it. And they're not going to be protected for, you know, at least six months because you can get it a little bit earlier. But for most of them, they won't be protected for that whole first year. And so if you and I are immune and we can't get sick, then I can hug and kiss that baby and not worry right. about passing them something. Yeah. I mean, as you're saying all this, I'm thinking about my grandson. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm able to kind of visualize and understand, you know, the impact, the importance. So I, I think today our, our, our hope and goal was to, to continue to provide that education and, and talk to the community. Our most susceptible are, like you said, the infants, but um, the elderly and, and uh, pregnant women. Pregnant women, you know, if they if they aren't immune, right? Anytime you have a lowered immune system, most of our elderly, you know, if you were born before 1967, you really consider, sorry, uh, yeah, 1967, you're really kind of considered immune because very likely you had measles as a kid. Almost nobody got out of it unscathed. And so they're likely to be immune. But of course, as you get older, your immune system kind of weakens a little bit and you might be more susceptible to what we call sort of a breakthrough infection. Same thing if you know, even if you've been vaccinated and you've had to undergo chemotherapy. Pregnant women, again, you know, have a lowered immune system. And if they're not already protected, um, it's very possible that they could get an infection, which could, you know, affect their pregnancy um, and, uh, you know, affect that, that baby. And so mostly we worry about, you know, those brand new babies in that first year of life before they've had an opportunity to be vaccinated. Because particularly if you travel or if you're exposed to people who travel, you know, they're really vulnerable and they're very, they're the most likely to um, go to the hospital and to need that supportive care because there's no technical like official treatment for measles. It's all supportive care of trying to make sure you stay hydrated. We take care of your fever. Um, and so it isn't something where it says, oh, I'm going to get sick. I'll just go get treatment. You know, you can't treat with antibiotics or anything like that. And so the best prevention we have is to develop some immunity in that sort of controlled situation that a vaccination allows that says, we're going to train your immune system to fight it. So if you ever get exposed, it's going to know what it is, fight it off right away before it can get established and make you sick. Wow. Okay. So if, if there's someone that's listening that goes, you know what, um, I, I need to get my my child vaccinated. We want them to reach out to their local doctor. Or maybe if, what if someone does not maybe have that doctor or uh, it, what are their options? Where, where can they go or where can we send them? Yeah, you know, we always want people to stay in contact with their regular healthcare provider, to, you know, talk to your child's doctor. If you don't have a doctor for your child, you know, to, to spend the time to establish one, because that's really important for kids in their entire, you know, development of from a, you know, from a baby until they're grown up in that adulthood, um, that, you know, there's milestones we want them to hit to be checked up on. If you don't have an established healthcare provider, you know, at the public health department, you can always be vaccinated. We have your, our, our, um, um, our, our mobile health clinic, you know, that has been going throughout the community um, that we can provide vaccinations on. Um, most of the times for children, especially vaccines are free or very low cost. And so it's something we don't want it to be cost prohibitive, but they can look at that. Depending on the age of a child, you can also try um, local pharmacies. Most pharmacies, you know, um, do carry the MMR vaccine because they do end up vaccinating a lot of adults, um, but they can, depending on the pharmacy, also vaccinate some children. They don't generally vaccinate babies, um, but if you have an older child who's kind of school age, some pharmacies can also provide the vaccine there. So we'd really encourage people to look if they're having trouble finding it to call us at the health department. We'll help them find sort of the most 
most convenient location to them um, or, you know, direct them to the next time our mobile health clinic clinic is going to be in the area um, or if they have the ability to come into our, you know, our brick and mortar health clinic in, in Bakersfield, we'd, we'd welcome them there. Now, so to kind of shift a little bit, it, well, before I before I, I do that and shift, is there anything else regarding measles that you think would be important to share? I mean, we've, we've covered a lot. There's a lot of educational conversation that's that's taken place. It's really kind of hit home for me. Is there anything else that because I want I want to kind of shift and talk about some other a couple of other topics? Sure. Last thing about measles is you know if you think you've been exposed or you think you might have measles, it's really important to call your healthcare provider instead of showing up because what we don't want them to do, which has uh, happened in some of these exposures where someone's feeling sick, they show up at an urgent care and emergency department or their regular healthcare provider and, you know, inadvertently exposes everybody in the waiting room, exposes everybody in the doctor's office. You know, a lot of times, and we learned this um, in responding with COVID, where if you talk to your healthcare provider, they might come and meet you outside in your car right. or say, you know what, come in as the last patient of the day so that we don't expose other people. And so if you think you might have measles, you, you know, develop a fever, you have this um, really splotchy rash that, you know, appears suddenly, or you've heard you've been exposed or you've been somewhere where a measles exposure has happened, we want you to call first. You can call us at the health department or call your regular doctor, let them know, I think I might have been exposed to measles or I think I might have measles. What do you want me to do? Because then they can give you directions um, and, and avoid um, exposing more people. Be responsible. You're thinking, you're thinking about for others, which I mean, very thoughtful. And that's, you know what, it, I probably had you not said it, I may not have even thought to do that. So, you know, thank you for sharing that. Now, when I ask you about, um, I mean, I'm a flu shot getter. Okay. So, and I, have we kind of rolled through flu season? Yep. We're, we're on the tail end of flu season. Okay. Yep. I, cause I, every fall I try to make sure I get, I get my flu shot and it's, it, it makes a huge difference for me personally. I remember that it seemed like every year I would, I would get something, I'd get the flu and I'd be down for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I was one of those. It just knocked me right down two weeks. The, the, now I, I rarely get sick at all. And if I do, it seems like it's only a couple of days. It's, it really minimizes. And so I'm a, I'm a regular for the flu uh, vaccine every year. And but that strain seems to change. I mean, and that's, so what's the, the impact or the importance of, of getting that flu vaccination come fall? Yeah, absolutely. Flu is unfortunately a virus that changes often. And so this is why, you know, we have an annual flu shot and sort of at the beginning of every flu season, we encourage you to get that annual flu shot because um, there's sort of these these little changes that happen. And I kind of akin it to something like, you know, um, if you change your hairstyle, right? You know, it's still flu, but it might look different. And when you run into somebody who, you know, had a drastic change in their hair, you may not notice them, you know, the moment you see them, or you might not notice them from afar. And so you might have to get up close or hear their voice or notice other things that says, oh, this is something I know and recognize or someone I know and recognize. And so the same thing happens with flu, where it changes just a little bit every year that our bodies might take a little longer than we want to notice it and fight it. And so this is where we see sometimes we have these, you know, we call them antigenic um, drift of where it's sort of changing year to year because flu is traveling around the world constantly. You know, our flu season tends to be in our winter months and the Southern hemisphere, it tends to be in their winter months, which is our summer months. So while we're, you know, while we're sort of enjoying the heat of the summer, um, flu is circulating other parts of the world. And then when it comes back around to us, it's gone through, you know, millions of people and has had a little bit of a change. There are times where we have what we call antigenic shift, where we have a major shift in that virus. Virus. And if you think way back when to H1N1 swine flu, you know, back in 09, that was um, an example of we saw a huge shift in the um, influenza virus. And so our bodies didn't recognize it. We didn't know it was flu. We didn't know it was bad and we couldn't fight it off as quickly. And so that's why we saw a lot of people get sick during that time. And so then there was a change in the flu vaccine that says, oh, we need to make a shift. This is what's commonly circulating. Let's tell everybody about it. You know, let's tell all of our bodies about it that says, look out for this one. You know, it's putting it on that big um, wanted poster saying, be on the lookout. Here's what's likely coming around. And so that way, when we are exposed to something like flu, our bodies will recognize it. And so this is why it's important to keep up with it every year, because some people are like, well, I got one last year. Do I really need one this year? But every year, you know, about this time of year, we're actually looking at what's circulating in the Southern Hemisphere, getting ready for what we might see in the fall so we can start that production and prepare for it. 
it's not always perfect because what is circulating the southern hemisphere right now may not be what's circulating at the end, right? It, there's sort of this ebb and flow of um, what's spreading at any given point in time. And so that's why some years the flu shot's very good and it has a really strong protective mechanism. Other years it's not as good and, you know, you still might come down sick. Um, hopefully, as long as you're getting that flu shot, even if you did get sick, it's going to be a shorter duration, right? You know, instead of being, you know, super sick in bed for two weeks at a time, it might be a day or two. And for a lot of people, they kind of shake it off as it's just a cold when it might have been an actual, you know, it might be influenza, but then they can be back up and running and doing their normal things quicker because we're just saying, you know, here's a bad guy, here's a bad guy. Sometimes as our body um, learns, all these things are are things we want to fight. It starts making those connections, right? That's something that looks similar. It's going to say, you know what? That's probably something bad that I also want to send my immune system to fight off. And so that's why every year we say, okay, this is what we think is coming, but just in case, it's usually very closely related um, and recognizable to what actually ends up circulating um, in, you know, in California, in the United States during our flu season. Okay. Wow. It's, it's amazing. I never even really put that global, you know, concept together and thinking about the different hemispheres and how our, you know, it's summer here, it's winter on the other end of the, the world, the lower half and vice versa and, and things it circulates. Yeah, that's, I never even thought of it. You helped put it, put it all together for me. I want to ask you about um, the uh, hepatitis and, and, or is there anything else going on in Kern County that maybe we should be aware of or be paying attention to? So, you know, in Kern County, as, as we're getting into the hot season, we always want to talk about things like um, heat-related illness, right, of being prepared for mm-hmm. that, especially when we've seen a lot of this sort of hot, cold, hot, cold weather of people just being aware that your body yeah. takes time to adjust and to be to be wary of things like that. Um, as we get into the hot season, we also start talking about valley fever, for example. Right. Um, we don't see a lot of that in Tehachapi, but if you're traveling around in the Central Valley, we want to make sure people are aware because oftentimes with valley fever, unfortunately, um, with people don't have super high of a fever, uh, they may not seek medical attention. Tension, but valley fever um, is something that is treatable. And so, you know, if someone, if you've had a fever, if you had a cough that just won't seem to go away, we really encourage people to reach out to their healthcare provider um, to, you know, to ask to see if they need to be checked for anything else, if they need medication for it. Most people who get valley fever, you know, don't need medication, but some can get very sick. And so this is another time of year where we want to warn people and just remember that, you know, to avoid being out when it's dusty. And if you get sick, talk to your healthcare provider. So with some of the wind that kicks up, I, I, I've had a, I know a couple of people that have had valley fever mm-hmm. and they worked on the Antelope Valley side of mm-hmm. Tehachapi and the, they were in the, uh, the solar yes. out in the solar fields and the wind kicks up and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a dust storm. Mm-hmm. So this is a spore that, that that's that gets airborne through the dust and then it beds itself in your lungs is that yep exactly it's it's a fungus that grows in the ground and so it typically grows you know six to twelve inches so it's not on the top soil where the sun's exposed right this is a mold okay and so it's growing where it's sort of dark um, and so what we generally see is valley fever spores get kicked up when there's earth movement you know a really strong dust storm that's kicking up tons of dirt um, when there is new digging for any reason if we're grading dirt or if we are digging trenches you know those are opportunities where we expose the soil where that fungus lives and then it gets kicked up in the air we breathe it in as people it kind of lodges in our lungs and and, you know it's a fungus and it starts growing and it can make us sick a lot of people their immune system is going to respond we call it sort of encapsulation it sort of takes it and and kind of controls it says you are bad we're gonna surround you and not let you you know make people sick Um, for some you know very small uh, proportion of people it can get outside their lungs to other parts of their body their skin into their central nervous system and their brain their joints Um, and so when it disseminates through your body goes to other parts outside your lungs, it can be harder to treat. And so all of it is, you know, most people start with that cough and it's usually a cough that doesn't go away. Unfortunately, what we find is we as people might be like, you know, it doesn't bother me too much. And so we don't go to healthcare right away because we're like, okay, it'll go away. And we, we wait it out. And then we realize we've been coughing for a while. Um, and then, you know, during that time, it may have spread. And so that's why we really encourage people. If you've coughed for more than two weeks without, you know, um, a reasonable explanation, you might want to talk to your healthcare provider because they might want to 
test you because valley fever is a simple blood test. And so that's something we also want people to know is, you know, you, it can be detected through a blood test um, while it's still in your lungs. If it goes to other places, sometimes it takes a little bit more work to diagnose. But we, you know, we know it's throughout the Central Valley. Kern County is a hotbed for it. We know it grows in our soil. Um, it's just really conducive to that. And what we actually think about is something like last year, we had lots of rain and lots of moisture. Um, that's sort of the opportunity where a fungus can grow. And then as it dries out, sort of as we get to the summer months and it gets a little bit more arid, we get sometimes those, you know, summer winds that come through as it starts blowing up in the air. And so we want people to sort of be aware that it's out there. Lots of people in Kern County have already been exposed sometime in their life. They're likely, you know, immune and not going to get sick from it. Most people don't. But if you are new to the area, we want you to be, you know, um, to be knowledgeable that if you get sick, to talk to your healthcare provider um, so that they can, you know, do a full assessment. Might be something completely else, but if it's valley fever and they want you on treatment, we want that sooner rather than later. Right. You know, I'm a, a regular blood donor, mm -hmm. and I know one of the questionnaires is, have you ever had valley fever? So has that become like a, 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 for a, a, a disqualifier as a blood donor? Do you know? I mean, is that if you've had it or is it something that once you've had it and is it always with you and you're always kind of a, a long term disqualifier to be maybe a blood donor or? Yeah, I asked them this question a long time ago, so I, I don't want to misspeak, but I, I believe when I kind of asked, you know, why do you guys ask about this? I believe they told me that they just want to check to see how long it's been since you've had it, you know, or you've been diagnosed or are you on current medications for it? Because some people with valley fever will need to be on a lifelong medication. Okay. Most people do not. Most people it's, you know, six months or so of treatment or, you know, and just depending on, on how your body is responding. But it's just one thing because it's so common here, they want to make sure um, to check that you're not actively sick, obviously, right? We want healthy blood donors um, and that we want to just, you know, they're, they're checking to make sure there isn't any reason for you not to donate blood. So as far as I know, it doesn't automatically disqualify you from ever donating again, because there are some conditions, um, you know, will they ask you not to donate afterwards. But as far as I know, for Valley Fever, they just want to find out if you've ever had it and then they ask you you know well how long ago have you had it are you still seeing a doctor about it um you know we talk about titers with valley fever like what's your titer um to know you know is it how is your immune system responding is it you know fighting really hard against it and maybe maybe now's not a good time to donate blood right put and tax your body some more or you know was it 10 years ago you got diagnosed everything's fine hasn't been an issue um i believe you're still able to donate blood interesting Oh my gosh, I'm learning so much. <laughs> I love these shows that when we have a guest like yourself on and I'm able to learn in the science of different things and everything that I, it seems like these topics are all a science-based that I'm just completely fascinated. <laughs> well, we love to be here, love to educate. You know, we love the questions because there is there is so much, you know, we love to share with people because as as we all know more, we can make informed decisions of, yeah. of what we need as a, as a healthcare community, as a person, you know, as our overall community here in Kern County. Well, Kim, at Kern County Public Health, what are some of the frequent questions that you do get from the community? Oh, goodness. Um, Put you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of questions, um, you know, because we, we have just a, such a wide range of services. And so, you know, today we're talking about measles, valley fever, infectious diseases, communicable diseases, which we get a lot of questions about um, because they get reported to the health department. But we just, we run the gamut. We have a number of programs that work with maternal and child health and finding out, you know, what to do during pregnancy and educating people and having nurses come, you know, to your, your home and and help you through that pregnancy and come alongside you to make sure you have you know uh, hopefully an easy pregnancy you know an easy birth and, and a healthy child um, we have a number of programs are uh, um around education and health education, um, tobacco awareness. And there's just, we, we get such a variety of questions. It's really kind of fun because every day might be something new about what's going on in the world and and how could we help with those things. And so uh, I think that's one of the, the wonderful perks of working in public health or around public health is it's it's everywhere, you know, with, you know, um, environmental health uh, is also a part of our public health agency. So questions about, um, uh, you know, restaurant inspections, we tend to get things like that or um, permitting for, for different types of um, 
you know, our wells, our septic tanks, all of that, you know, come through our health department. And so we find it really valuable to be able to just educate people because a lot of people don't know a lot of the things that happen in public health are, are behind the scenes. And if they're working well, you don't even notice that everything is fine. And it's when there's a disruption and something says, you know, there's a burst water pipe and we have to have a boil water notice that, you know, public health comes into light of all the things that hopefully run successfully in the background. And when there's a hiccup, you know, a lot of this is education with our community, letting them know something out of the norm is happening and here's how you can protect yourself and so i think you know some of those interesting calls are 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 maybe the way to phrase it are the most successful calls where people just say i need help and we really work and say well what do you need help how can we help you and get you connected you know public health doesn't do it all there's so many community partners um, but we hope to be able to navigate people that says well what help do you need let's try to get you to that resource to that person to that agency Um, and i think you know particularly our, our staff in our call center who answer sort of those generic calls they do a really amazing job of just trying to figure out what people need you know and that's what i hope um, for us at public health, we always hope that, you know, we're, we're one of those first people that, you know, first agency that people think of when they need help with something, because it may not be within our purview to solve that problem, but we can certainly try to direct you to the right place. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fascinating when you started talking about the different permitting process and things. I am now the, the Tatchby Farmers Market is mm-hmm. now in my department and we're required to fill up permits uh, through your department to make sure that our farmers market that we're offering to the community is to the to the correct standards, you know, to make sure that it is, you know, every that all the vendors are properly licensed and everyone. There's just there's a lot of work that goes in, but it's about the overall health of the community. Yes, it's always about the health and the safety of the community. I know sometimes sometimes it feels restrictive, and it's like, well, why do we have to jump through all these hoops? And at the end of the day, it's because um, you know we want to make sure whatever we're offering to the public, you know, to our communities, are as safe as possible. You know that we have gone through the steps that make sure you know that a food vendor, for example, um, has undergone you know safety training, so they know about safe food handling practices, and they don't end up you know, giving us something that's undercooked or contaminated that then results in us getting sick and maybe needing to go to the hospital, you know, and so a lot of that is making sure, you know, that we have parameters that kind of safeguard all the things that are happening because we want them to be able to happen. We want our community to get together and enjoy something like a farmer's market because that's a wonderful opportunity to bring the community, to support our local community, Um, but we also don't want it to be something that says, oh, you know what, when I went to that farmer's market, I did this or I ate this and I got sick and now I'm never going back. So a lot of those things, you know, ultimately are intended to protect um, that event, that organization, because one bad experience will keep a person from returning and it will also keep more people from returning that one person talks about their bad experience that says, you know what, I got food poisoning from that. And now, you know, dozens of people who might have frequented that business isn't going to show up, you know, or whatever that kind of process is. And so, um, you know, that's why at Public Health, we take a very sort of educational approach. It's not just follow the rules because I said so. It's right. understand why rules exist because they're, they're there to protect you and me, to protect our families as well, so that we don't have to worry about, um, you know, a a pool that hasn't been properly chlorinated and we might get a waterborne illness, right? And so those are things that says, you know, that it needs to be chlorinated to a certain level. We have to check it this often so that, you know, whoever is going swimming in that public pool knows that it's safe to do so. And that's, you know, what a lot of the permitting processes are about of making sure that we can, you know, say to the public, our community safe yeah. and that we've done what, you know, all the things that we can so that one, you can make an informed decision about what you're doing, but also that some of these rules, you know, safeguard us because I can't know, you know, everything about everything. I have to trust that wherever I go, that the service I'm getting has been looked into, vetted in some way, and that it's a good thing or a safe thing for me and my family to do. Now, you mentioned uh, vendors, and as I brought up the farmer's market and all the permitting, we make sure that everyone's got their, all their different permits in order as we submit for our environmental health permit. But we've worked very closely with uh, Kern County Public Health and Bryn, the director, uh, in the Tehachapi area because we've had a lot of illegal vendors or people that just set up roadside. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to, because based on my, I'm retired law enforcement out of LA, so I have some knowledge in this area, but I, I want, you're an expert um, in this, in public health. There's a reason why 
brick and mortar businesses. They've got permits. There's inspections that take place from the health department. There's a reason that these businesses that are at uh, street fairs, farmers markets, they go through this permitting process to make sure it's healthy for uh, everyone that attend. Now, when we see someone that just sets up on the side of the street Mm -hmm. on the end of a a corner, a vacant lot, there are concerns that automatically kind of red flag for me. Can you touch on that a little bit about the the reasons why that that's people should, before they just stop off on a dirt lot and uh, purchase things from a, a, a roadside vendor that's not permitted, the, the, the health concerns. Yeah, absolutely. You know, from from a public health standpoint, you know, from our infectious disease standpoint, we worry about things like foodborne illness. And so one thing I always tell people is, you know, when you see a stand by the side of the road, you know, and, and think about, you know, where does that person wash their hands? If they are there from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., you know, where do they use the restroom? You know, when we think about something like a, um, you know, a food truck, you know, there is potable water where they do wash their hands. Food trucks have specific locations because they have to get agreements with somewhere nearby that says they can use the restroom if they need to. Um, And, you know, those are things that we want people to consider. Where do they wash their hands? How often do they wash their hands? If it's something like, you know, for example, cut up fruit, you know, they are touching the food you're going to consume and you don't, you know, there's no evidence that they've been able to, um, you know, properly store it or, you know, keep the utensils that they're using safe and clean, that they have protected against cross-contamination. When we're out in the element, there's things like vermin, flies, you know, if there are rodents running around um, that, you know, a sort of roadside, um, you know, cart may not be able to protect against. And so those are kind of things we want people to consider of both sort of, you know, we call it the ick factor as well as the sick factor of, and, you know, for something like food, it may not be immediately that you get sick. Something like, um, you know, something like salmonella can take several days. And so some Sometimes we don't even associate it with something um, that we had, you know, a few days ago, but we just ask people to really consider, um, you know, if they don't have a permit, then we have no way of assuring they've gone through proper training, that they have taken care of um, the food or the materials that they're using in an appropriate manner to minimize your risk. Um, And so, you know, we always want people to make those educated decisions, but really be thoughtful about that. Because if you consider, you know, if I'm on the side of a road at an intersection of two highways, you know, how far? Or is it to the nearest restroom? Where do you think that person relieves himself if they need to? Right. Um, you know, there's a whole other component that we're not involved with as much in public health, but, you know, you might have been in law enforcement about, you know, human trafficking and labor trafficking, right. you know, where who chooses in the heat of summer, it's 115 degrees outside to sit outside, um, you know, in, in the heat um, selling. And so, you know, we know there's a human aspect to this and we try to be um, you know, we try to be respectful and understanding that there's, you know, this is a human being and there is a need, you know, they are trying to make money. Um, but we worry as for our community of the safe, you know, the safety and the health of our community. And there's also just this thought of, you know, how is this person here? Are there other ways and other mechanisms of things they need help in? You know, because it's not always just this enforcement. You should never do this. But a lot of people are in situations where they do need support in other ways. And if we can navigate them to um, other resources, then they might not be in a situation, you know, that puts them in that environment. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing, you know, th- when you see some of the these foods that are being prepped, and the thought of the cross contamination. I think back if I'm in my kitchen and I'm getting ready to prep something, I'm washing my hands. It seems like after every time I touch something and when they're out, you know, at uh, this vacant lot, they don't have access to do that. And I don't want to see them hit, dip their hands into a bucket <laughs> and then dry them up. Cause that's not, that's not taking care of, you know, you're still going to cross contaminate. Right. You know. So, I, I really try to think of my, I've had the conversation with my wife. It's like, no, we're not stopping there, you know? Uh, and the reason is it's about the health. It's about the safety and e- e- even the, the human trafficking. And that's a whole nother conversation and podcast that we could get down into. But I mean, I'm just on the health side. I think that's, and I'm, I, I don't want to uh, dissuade the entrepreneur, but there's a correct way to do it. And the health department will license and permit uh, certain food vendors, you have to meet the standard. Maybe it's with the food truck and they go through a process and you, you vet their education. You make sure that they are, they have the capability of heating things, at the proper temperature. Uh, they have the ability to, to clean. Th- those are all some of the, the aspects that go into 
what you do. Yes, absolutely. So, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that because it has been an issue and some people don't understand, but I think they think about, Hey, this guy's just trying to make a dollar. I get it. Yep. But there's the health aspect that's in for us in government, public safety is our number one goal. Yes. So that's the thing that we kind of work together as neighboring sister agencies to make sure that we're all on the same page of working together with a, a common goal of the public safety. Right. So um, we've talked about a lot of different things and I appreciate your time. Is there anything that we haven't talked about you think that might be of, of interest or concern? Um, you know, something we haven't really hit on today is chronic disease, which is something, okay. you know, we we have lots of concerns of, you know, uh, in public health, right? Chronic disease is something where, uh, unfortunately, it's going to take us five, 10 years to see if we've really made an impact on it. But we know in our community, for example, Kern County um, has the highest um, mortality rate due to diabetes in the state. And so this is something that's really important of, you know, why are people, you know, we don't have the highest rate of diabetes of people having diabetes, but, you know, our, our population in our community, people with diabetes are more likely to to die in Kern County than other other places in in California. And so, a lot of things we're looking at are, you know, why is that? What do we do about that? You know, for one, it's a lot of undiagnosed diabetes. People may not know that they have it, and so it, you know, it's going untreated. Um, you know, chronic disease is something uh, a lot of us, you know, may. Um, know about and think about, but may not always take every action that we could. Um, a lot of chronic disease requires a lot of sort of long-term management with healthcare and being able to go to those routine visits and have your doctor check on you and decide whether or not you need medication, if there's a, um, you know, a lifestyle change or an environment change that would benefit you. Um, and so we're always looking at other ways to um, allow people to sort of know where they are. One of our newer programs, I don't know if you've heard about, is it's called um, Know Your Numbers. We're out in the community and we are doing um, sort of these uh, health screenings of checking your blood pressure, your you know, your cholesterol, your blood sugar, and to say, you know, are you at risk? You know, do you have an elevated number where you might want to go talk to your doctor about it? Um, you know, and as part of that program also, in addition to doing those um, health screenings, is offering nutrition education, physical fitness um you know, activities of really trying to help us as a community develop healthier habits around um, so to hopefully reduce our rates of chronic disease. Um, because we know something like high blood pressure is affected by your diet as well as, you know, your physical activity. And for many of us, we could all, um, you know, do a little better. We've been talking a lot this year about, you know, a healthier Kern County and taking those tiny steps to be just a little bit healthier. If it's take the stairs today instead of the elevator, if it is, you know, um, let me say, you know, no to that piece of candy that I really want. But today I'm just going to be like, no, I don't really need it. Of, you know, a piece out of time making healthier choices so we can have a healthier community. Because we know chronic disease for one is expensive. Um, and that, you know, if we can prevent it, um, you know, that we could all be healthier. For a lot of us, it's about uh, demonstrating those healthy habits, you know, to our children um, or our grandchildren and saying, you know, this is, this is a fun way to be healthy and encouraging, let's eat healthy foods, you know, from our farmer's market. Let's have some physical activity as part part of our lives, not, not exercise and having to work out, but the things we do already that we can increase our heart rate, spend time with our families and really encouraging that environment that, that is a healthier Kern County. We know it's hard sometimes as we have, you know, super cold winters and we have super hot summers that being outdoors and getting physical activity in can sometimes be challenging. And what are the alternatives to saying, I'm going to move more today. I'm going to, you know, make smart decisions about what I eat and drink today. And so I think that's something we always encourage people to do. It's hard because the benefit is not immediate, right? Even right. even as someone, you know, who is trying to lose weight, you know, it's not, you know, you may have restricted your diet and increased your physical activity, but you don't see it tomorrow that you've right. lost 10 pounds, right? It's a long-term ongoing thing. And it's, it's sometimes hard to upkeep and to change those habits. Um, and we just want to really encourage our community to find ways, you know, hopefully with each other of spending time, you know, physical proximity. I know uh, over the last couple of years, we really learned the value of being physically with one another and spending time to, you know, yes, we can go out to eat, but we can make healthier decisions when we go out to eat. You know, yes, we can exercise and we can find, you know, we can make time in our lives. We all feel so busy, but, you know, it can just be five minutes of saying, I'm going to do a little bit more and then have a healthier lifestyle. And that hopefully, you know, reverse some of those effects we might have if we have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, diabetes, help manage those things so that we can have long, healthy, productive lives. Wow. You know, it's it, something that we just started 
that, um, and it's and it's really kind of based on the things you're talking about, little things that we can do. And we thought here at the city, we've, we've had success with coffee with the mayor. We invite the community to come talk to us. Uh, coffee with a cop, some other programs like that. And we thought, why don't we create a walking group? Yes. So we have a walking group where every Thursday morning at 11, we invite the community to come and join us. And we have a, a two to three mile loop that we walk through downtown. And we invite the community to come out, talk to us, have a conversation. But just talk about, you know, getting a little bit healthy and having uh, and getting to enjoy the beautiful Tehachapi scenery. Well, that sparked our Parks and Rec District to have a fitness challenge, a quarterly fitness challenge. You could put teams together. So we put a team together that's now in this. So we're all walking. There's 20 members from the city and f- over 40 teams in, in our community that are part of this spring into, spring into action fitness challenge. And I've noticed that the individuals that are on our team are all kind of getting that little like they did it the first week. And then the second week, it's like, oh, I, I, I walked a total of eight miles last week. I, I'm going to do 10. And it's that you've, you, we kind of inspire each other or the competitive nature that's, that's in us. And all of a sudden, before we know it, we're all tracking each other's miles in this inner competition. And, and it's, it's, it's healthy, it's fun, and it's added to the kind of the social aspect of us all interacting. There's a, there's a, a lot of benefits to something as simple as just walking. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love to hear about that. That's so exciting and, and so much fun because it's it's a little thing and it's a few minutes out of the day, but it can create such an amazing environment because you know we have we have worksite wellness at public health as well. And what what I love about it is you get to interact with people you may not normally. You know, for right. for you bringing the community and it says I'm a person. We're just normal right. people and we're just going to have a conversation while we're hanging yeah. out and talking. But so much can can get done. You get to meet people and understand people and, and find needs and problem solve in, in sort of that new environment, you know, and of course we know that, um, exercise and movement is, is really good for your brain. And so sometimes you have those aha moments and right. in, in something we're just walking around and, and what a wonderful way to enjoy your community. And so I, I love that concept and, you know, it's, it's like everything else. Once you get that ball rolling, it keeps going and then it speeds up and you have more competition and, you know, you realize, you know, it might've taken you half an hour to walk those two miles before. And now you're getting your two miles in, you know, in 15 minutes. And all of a sudden you're, you're doing four miles in the same amount of time. Um, and that, that energy can build on itself. So yeah. it's an amazing thing. I'm so, I'm so excited to hear you guys have started that and how well it's going. It, it, and staff, it, it, people will walk by my office cause I'm the team captain for our team. He goes, I'm walking to lunch today. Oh. Or I'm going, I'm walking to the, our, our next campus, which is just a, a short distance away, but they're walking instead of jumping in the car to go over to the police station or something, just little things like that. And, but they're letting me know I'm getting my steps in. Good. All right. I'm getting my steps in and it's been really good. And, and talking with our city manager, he's had some great conversations, very constructive that people have come out to, to ask about things. And these are people that we don't see come to coffee with the mayor and the other events, because for them, it's a motivator too. They're like, Okay, I want to. I need to get out and walk. Okay, let's. And they ask about their city government, and we're there to answer those questions. So it's, it really has been connecting us with the community. And then we are personally, selfishly getting a little bit of a benefit too. <laughs> Absolutely, that, that never hurts. But yeah, yeah what a, what an opportunity, especially you know, not everybody. You know, some people can be kind of intimidated by that sort of right. formal. I need to make an appointment and sit down at a desk and you know, yeah. be dressed nice and things like that. And you know, this informal ability that says, you know just come talk to us. We're going right. to hang out and it doesn't have to be anything you need. I mean, we could just, you know, talk about, you know, the sporting events that happened over right. the weekend and, and that opens up the conversation to yes. when they need something, yes. they know who you are and they know that they can ask you and that you're willing to listen. Exactly. You know, I think that I know puts us out in the community as, as people and part of the community. We're not yeah. behind that locked door. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. And I'm just so excited, you know, for the whole community of Tehachapi to be able to, to, to access government in that way, but to really just be involved and to be inspired and, and really, you know, enjoy this beautiful community here. Yeah, it is. This is a very special place in Kern County. And, you know, just before COVID had hit, I know the public health department had come up, you guys were getting ready to launch some health programs in the community. COVID hit, shut it all down. So when you guys are ready to re-kick those off, tell Michelle, I would sell her. Let, to let me know we're on board because we were going to be on board when they were ready to launch. So uh, City of Tehachapi is, is a go. Awesome. <laughs> so anything, uh, Kim, that we haven't talked about that, that you want to get out? I, I know oh, I've hit you, hit you that without a couple times and you've, you've had a couple more, but... 
No, we just, you know, we always want to encourage our community to, to make those healthy choices, you know, and we welcome questions, we welcome comments, um, because we're always looking to to partner with our community, right? You know, you know, in government, we, we can lead and we can support, but we really need the community to come around and say, here's what we need, here's how we can do it, because we're, we're here to be part of it, not to tell people what to do or tell them how it should be done, but, you know, what's, what's the need and figure out how can we can support that. And, you know, some of our most successful work is really community driven that either the ask came from the community or the first steps came from the community and then we were able to you know help partner or to build bridges so that these things can flourish because I think all of us in our community want to be healthier we want a healthier environment for ourselves for our families for our loved ones you know and and that we all want to be able to contribute to that so we welcome that at public health you know we're we're excited to be able to be back out in the community again you know we've been able to sort of bring back all of the old services because like you mentioned during COVID a lot of things were very focused a lot of things shut down and, and we're seeing you know in this year especially um just stuff um you know, coming to that new normal of being together right. and opening up and being in person and, and new ideas coming out of, of what was and what can be. And so we're really excited in this period um, with the health of our community that we have a, a positive, hopeful outlook for all of Kern County, um, that we can all make healthier choices as an individual person. We as a community can come together to foster healthier policies um, and, in you know, support healthier um, environments. And, and that, you know, when we look back, we will say, you know, this was, you know, we all love living and working in Kern County. This is a wonderful place right. to be and that we can leave a brighter spot, you know, when we look back on it in 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Now, if people want to uh, reach out or have a question, website, Facebook, social medias? Yeah, we have, you know, we have social media. Um, we have our website at kernpublichealth.com. They can always call us at 661-321-3000. Like I said, you know, we can't solve every problem, but we do really often have the ability to help connect people to where they're trying to get. If they're not sure who to talk to, um, we will always do our best to kind of find that right resource, that right agency for you to talk to, um, depending on what you need. Well, uh, you guys have always been receptive to us when we call. So please tell Bryn, thank you. I know that Greg would want me to, to say that because Bryn has been a great partner uh, since she has taken over and it's just been a good working relationship that we have. So um, please tell her thank you. And uh, I appreciate your time coming up from Bakersfield to make the trip up here to share uh, what you have today. We are happy to do it. You know, we are grateful for you as a, as a mechanism of communication, of getting good information out to people so they can make those healthier choices and, and you know, as a place to start asking those questions so that you can be that voice for them. So we appreciate all the work that you're doing um, and communicating with the community. Well, thank you very much. It's Kim Hernandez, lead epidemiologist for the County of Kern's Public Health Department. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, folks, if you've got a thought or question based on today's conversation, send it to us at media at TehachapiCityHall.com. I'll get it to Kim or we'll get the answer for you and, and send it right back. We appreciate the time you spend with us and we'll catch you again soon right here on Tehachapod. Tehachapod is a conversation about Tehachapi, featuring the community members who make this such a special place to call home. If you have a question or a thought you'd like to share, email media at TehachapiCityHall.com. Thank you to Gary Mazzola for sharing his song, This is Tehachapi.